everyone. My name is Francesca. I am an interpreter working for California State Parks here at the beautiful Pismo State Beach Monarch Butterfly Grove. And I'm so excited to get to connect with you today to teach you about one of my favorite animals that calls this grove their home. And of course, today we're going to be learning about the Western Monarch Butterfly. And the first thing I want to do is show you around where I'm standing right now. As you can see, I'm outside. It's a very sunny and warm day, even in the winter time, here along the central coast of California. And I'm gonna grab my iPad and show you all of the trees that are around me. Now, our grove is one of the largest overwintering habitats for the Western monarchs. Now, what does that mean, overwintering? Well, it's winter time right now where I am. It is November, heading into December, January, and February. Those are our winter months. That's when the monarchs are gonna be here. And an overwintering habitat means it's where these butterflies spend their winter. Does anyone know what the word habitat means? Let's see if anyone can define that scientific term. Great, if you're thinking an animal's home, you're exactly right. And our state parks are home to many different types of animals. This grove right here is a very important habitat for the Western monarch butterflies. And today I want us to learn a bit about their home and how we are protecting habitat here at our parks. I want us to also learn about the life cycle of the butterfly, specifically the monarch butterfly. We're also gonna learn a bit about the animal's anatomy and senses, and we're gonna learn about how they make one of the most incredible migration known to all animals. The mighty monarchs are known for their incredibly long migration that they take before arriving right here at Pismo State Beach. So to get started, I wanna show you a map of where this park is located. You'll be noticing the United States, Let's zoom in a little bit closer right here to the central coast of California, looking for that blue dot. Now I want you to imagine for a second that you are a butterfly. You get your wings going, get warmed up a bit. Imagine you're up there in that blue sky right above the grove. There you are. You're coming in from your long journey. You're trying to escape the cold from up in northern Canada and the northern US. You're flying south for the winter, looking for the perfect spot to spend the winter. And what do you see down below you? You might see the crashing waves of the Pacific. You might see some pretty nice treetops. So take a look at this picture. This is a butterfly view of the Pismo State Beach Monarch Butterfly Grove. And you're that little butterfly wanting to land down here to spend the winter in these trees. Now, why do the monarchs prefer this grove? Well, let's first figure out what a grove is. It's kind of like a forest. Do you see how there's lots of trees all right next to each other? So about a hundred years ago, farmers actually planted all of these eucalyptus trees right next to each other, very close together, to create a windbreak from an area where they used to have farming out here. Now these tall eucalyptus trees behind me block the wind and create what's known as a microclimate. Has anyone ever heard of the word climate before? Maybe you're thinking of climate change and other science terms you've learned. But micro means tiny, and climate um, is kind of the long-term temperature or weathering patterns of an area. So the microclimate that these trees produce is different than it is right out on the beach. It creates kind of a little bubble or a perfect little grove or forest where the temperature is just right for the monarchs because monarch butterflies, they don't like the cold. You will not find monarchs up where it's snowing. That's why they come here in the wintertime, because it does not snow here. It stays a nice, warm temperature. Here we are in November, and I'm kind of sweating today. It's about 75 degrees in November. So the butterflies, that's why they come here. They like it to be nice and warm. In fact, a butterfly, did you know they can't fly unless it's 55 degrees temperature outside? They need the warmth to warm up their wings to get their kind of blood flowing and the liquids flowing in their body to have power to fly on a hot day. If it's too cold, they will freeze. So 
so 55 is the magic number. So back to the story of the butterfly, you come landing down here into the grove, you start to see some of your friends, and that makes you happy. And the other strategy or animal adaptation that these butterflies use is to cluster together. So take a look at this picture. It might just look like a branch with dead leaves, but if you look closer, you'll notice those are actually monarch butterflies with their wings closed up. Now they're all next to each other in what we call a cluster. I remember the word cluster because it kind of reminds me of cuddling. And the butterflies, they like to cuddle together. Why do you think they like to cuddle in the winter? Why are they all grouped together? Hmm. If you're thinking for warmth, again, you're correct. That's one of their adaptations, to group together in clusters overnight to kind of create extra warmth and it helps them camouflage. Remember how we thought it kind of looked like dead leaves on the branch? The camouflage adaptation is really clever. You might know of a lot of other animals that know how to camouflage. So camouflaging all together helps them hide from predators. They do have a few predators, different types of birds out here. Mockingbirds are one of them. Blackbirds might come down and, and eat the monarchs. Um, but most birds and other predators know to stay away because the monarch butterflies and in their caterpillar phase, they are actually poisonous, which we'll talk about in just a second from one of the foods sources that they eat. So we've kind of defined why the monarchs come here in the winter time. They like this microclimate. They like the trees out here behind us. But do you notice this little baby tree standing behind me? This is another important species I want to show you. This is called the Monterey cypress tree. And it is a native species that grows right along the central California coastline. So monarchs like the cypress and they also like the really tall eucalyptus. On the other side of me here too, do you see these pretty light blue leaves? These are baby eucalyptus trees that are just starting to grow. And they have a long ways to go because as you can see, the eucalyptus can grow up to 200 feet tall. So a pretty cool grove habitat here. And here at California State Parks, our job is to protect not only the butterflies that come here, but to protect their entire habitat. So we work hard with our scientists to study this area, to make a map of where trees might fall down that we need to replant. Um, and our scientists are always working on trying to help rebuild and protect the animal's habitat. Okay. So now moving on from the animal's habitat, I want us to think a little bit more about the monarch's anatomy. So when you were younger, you might have learned about how to define an insect. And what I want us to talk about next are the body parts of an insect. Does anyone know what they are? Let me go ahead and put this picture up here to remind you. Okay, so seeing this butterfly, you'll see it has a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. An easy way for me to remember those three body parts is a little jingle or a little song that goes to the tune of head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Everyone knows that song, right? So what if I were to mix up the lyrics a little bit and call it head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen, head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. So now that you know the lyrics, head, thorax, abdomen. You probably want to learn the dance moves. So I'll back up a little bit to show you how we do it. But what you're going to do is you're going to glue your knees together, glue your feet together and stand kind of like you're the body of the monarch. You can flap your wings, but your body part is the main part. And once your knees are together, you're going to go head, thorax, abdomen, head, thorax, now, if you looked close at that picture, you might have also seen that monarchs have compound eyes. And what else do they have? Oh yeah, antennas too. And that's a monarch for you. So putting that all together now, we're gonna go head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen, head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen, compound eyes and antennas too. And that's a monarch for you. Pretty fun way to remember it, huh? So now let's learn a little bit more about their antennas. So we know a lot of insects have antennas. And for monarchs, these are a very important part of their body. 
because it actually helps them with sensory information, like knowing where they are and where they're going. And how about their eyes? Their eyes are a bit different than us. You might have learned about compound eyes before. And looking closely, can you see? Their eyes are actually made up of hundreds of tiny little eyes all put together to create two big ones. Now this allows them to see in multiple directions. And finally too, there's one last body part that helps them eat. But what do the adult monarchs in their butterfly phase actually eat? If you're thinking flowers and the nectar specifically from those flowers, you're absolutely correct. So our monarchs, they have tongues kind of like us, but their tongues roll all the way out of their body. So imagine you have a really long straw that's attached to your tongue. For a monarch, that straw is called the proboscis. And you can see it unravels, slurps up some nectar, and then ravels on back. So that's a pretty clever adaptation. Now we learned about their antennas, we learned about their compound eyes, we learned about their proboscis. Now all insects have one other thing in common, and that has to do with the amount of legs they have. As everyone know, insects have it six legs. Now our butterflies, in addition to their legs to help them move, they have another very clever adaptation, and that would be their big, beautiful wings. Now monarch wings come in fours. They have two on the top and two on the bottom. And the way that monarchs move and the patterns of the which they fly, I like to remember, it's kind of again, another little dance. And what they do is they go flap, flap, glide. So you wanna try that with me? Stand up, stretch it out and go flap, flap, glide. Okay, now that we've learned about the body parts of our monarch butterflies, let's learn about the different life cycle stages of the monarchs because they're not always in this cool butterfly phase of their life. So let's take a dive in to learn about the life cycle of the monarchs. Okay, so we'll start our story off today with the mother monarch. The mother monarch is flying around, has its eggs ready to be laid, but it is a very picky mom. It wants the best for its child, so it is gonna look for one specific plant. Does anyone know what plant the mom monarchs will lay their eggs on? There's only one type. If you're thinking of milkweed, you're absolutely correct. I think of it because the word milk is what our human babies need. Um, and the milkweed gets its name because the plant actually produces kind of a milky sap-like substance. Um, so that's where the plant gets its name from. But we know the monarchs, they actually eat the nectar from flowers. So they are not drinking milk like us mammals and us humans. But the milkweed plant is super important. Now see this little tiny egg? The mom lays the egg on the bottom of a milkweed leaf. Why would she lay the egg on the bottom? Let's think about predators and the important fact that you want to hide the eggs from predators. So putting them on the bottom of the leaf does that. It kind of shelters it on the bottom. Now this egg, look closely, it is very tiny. I want you to put your fingers together and imagine you're holding one single tiny grain of rice. Maybe you had rice for dinner this week and you can imagine how tiny that little egg is. Now what's about to happen to this egg is pretty incredible. This egg will grow over the next few days and once it hatches out, we're gonna see a little tiny larva or a caterpillar crawl out of its eggshell. Now this baby, tiny, cute little caterpillar is hungry right after it's born and it's a smart baby. What it's gonna do right away is get rid of all the evidence so what it's gonna do is it's gonna eat the eggshells because it doesn't want the predators to know that it has been there. So the first thing this little baby caterpillar does is he will munch on the eggshells and get rid of the evidence there from the egg casing that he was just born out of. Now this caterpillar is really hungry. We all know the saying of the hungry, hungry caterpillar and that is true because these caterpillars have a lot of growing to do when they are babies. So what do you think 
A caterpillar, a monarch caterpillar likes to eat. They're not the butterflies, so they're not gonna be eating the nectar. They're actually gonna be eating the leaves of that one specific plant that they're born on. Does everyone remember what it's called? That's right, the milkweed. So those smart moms laid their egg on the food that their babies would be eating. So the caterpillars, they're gonna crawl around munching and munching and eating so much milkweed leaves. They will chew off all the leaves of an entire milkweed plant as they continue to grow. Now caterpillars, they are invertebrates, which means they don't have a backbone and they actually have an exoskeleton. And when they grow, the exoskeleton doesn't grow with them. So what they have to do is shed their skin and shed that exoskeleton so they can keep growing. But what do you think they're gonna do after they shed that exoskeleton and it's sitting there on a leaf? Remember those predators? They don't want the predators to see their exoskeleton. So you're absolutely right. They're gonna munch away and eat that. Get rid of the evidence. And then they're gonna continue to eat the milkweed and can continue to grow bigger and bigger. They're gonna molt four or five times at the rate at which they're growing. That would be like if a little tiny baby human were to grow as big as a blue whale very, very quickly in a matter of weeks. So that scale is pretty incredible for how fast they grow. Now, once they start to get about an inch long, an inch and a half, these large, thick caterpillars are slowing down a little bit. They're getting ready for the next stage of their life cycle. But before we talk about the next stage, I wanna look at the coloring pattern on the caterpillar. Because these patterns here are another form of an animal's adaptation. Does anyone know what the warning colors mean when black and yellow are next to each other in nature? Sometimes we see these patterns on snakes. And what it is, it is it's kind of a warning sign, again, for predators to say, watch out, I am poisonous. And you're probably thinking, what? A caterpillar is poisonous? And the answer is yes. And they're poisonous because milkweed that they're eating actually has toxin in it. Now, the milkweed toxin is not poisonous enough to actually harm the caterpillars. They've adapted to kind of grow with this plant and with the toxins. But the toxins inside the caterpillar's body are toxic or poisonous for predators that might come along, like other birds or even other insects that might be kind of trying to swoop down and eat the caterpillar. Okay, so now we're fasting forward. The caterpillar has been growing and molting and eating all the milkweed for about two weeks now. And he's getting ready to enter the next stage of his life. So maybe some of you know what he's gonna do. He's gonna kind of crawl away and find a really good safe spot. This caterpillar is gonna crawl up and he's gonna produce a tiny little silk button. And from that little silk button that he produces, he is gonna hang down from his little feet, hanging down in the shape of a J. And this is called the J hook. And the reason he's doing that is he is preparing to form a chrysalis. So some of you might know about cocoons that moths form, but our butterflies form chrysalis. Now monarch chrysalises are very beautiful. Check out this bright green jade color. And as the, or as the caterpillar creates this chrysalis around him, his entire body becomes enclosed, kind of like inside of a sleeping bag, I like to think of it. Now this caterpillar is gonna do something very crazy when he's tucked up inside of the chrysalis. Does anyone know the scientific word for the process that is happening when the caterpillar changes into a butterfly? If you're thinking metamorphosis, you're exactly right. This scientific process is absolutely mind-blowing. What's happening inside that chrysalis is the caterpillar is kind of turning almost into a liquid, an unrecognizable animal as it's gonna reform. Its entire body structure is getting reassembled into a butterfly. Now this process takes about two weeks or about 15 days so it does not happen overnight because it is incredible what's going on inside of there. The chemistry involved to recreate a new form of life. 
Now, when we know this process is kind of coming to an end, that bright green color is gonna turn clear and we can actually see inside of the chrysalis. So check out this photo. Are you seeing the orange and black stripes of the adult monarch butterfly? Now we know that it's almost ready to break out of its chrysalis to enter the butterfly stage of its life. But before it does that, it's gonna slightly stretch. The chrysalis splits down one side, kind of like your sleeping bag unzipping, and the new butterfly, his wings are gonna start stretching out. But take a look at what it looks like. It's all wet, it's all kind of crumpled up. Do you think the butterfly can fly right away right after it comes out of the chrysalis? The answer is no way. It's just been taking kind of a long nap and it's kind of like maybe what you do first thing in the morning. You're gonna need to stretch your arms out wide. Get your blood flowing. So everyone take a little stretch break. Get your wings out as wide as they can go. Fingers out wide. And imagine you're a butterfly pumping its liquid. These butterflies don't actually have blood like we do. Their veins are kind of filled with this really cool liquid. And that liquid is gonna pump out of your thorax, out of your abdomen, and out into your wings. And the wings are gonna stretch out wide. And then on a sunny day, when the temperature is above 55 degrees, the monarch will take its first flight. So that is kind of the life cycle of our monarch. Okay, now let's talk about the monarch's incredible, mighty migration. We learned about its life cycle and how it turns into an adult monarch butterfly. And once it's in that butterfly stage, monarchs can fly. And even though they're tiny, only about one or two inches long, they can fly incredible distances. And does anyone know where the monarch flies to when they're not here at beautiful Pismo State Beach? Let's pull up a map here to see the migration route. Now migration means to move. So for monarchs, they're not gonna be walking, they're not gonna be crawling, they're gonna be flying. And they're flying incredible distances. Now you can see here on the west coast of the US, the western monarch butterflies travel from here along the central coast of California and they travel north up to the Pacific Northwest. So that includes places like Idaho, places like Oregon and Washington and even Canada. These butterflies will leave the US and go all the way to Canada. Now they begin their migration journey, they leave here in February. And when they leave our grove, I wanna tell you something crazy because it's not the same butterfly that starts the journey that finishes it. So it's kind of like a relay race. Has anyone ever done track and field or done some fun relay races before? So I want you to think about the monarchs kind of as in a race, a long race that they're pacing themselves on, and it's too far for just one monarch to go north. So what happens is that first monarch will leave Pismo State Beach, they will head north as far as they can go, a couple hundred miles, and they're gonna start looking for milkweed. They're gonna lay their eggs and begin that life cycle that we just learned about. And after they lay their eggs, the female moms and dads, they actually do die. So that generation is done and it's up to the next generation, up to that tiny little egg to carry on the tradition and to pass the baton and keep traveling north. So once that new little caterpillar is born, eats all the milkweed, learns to fly, it's gonna continue heading north, up in the right direction. And the reason it knows where to go has to do with kind of the genetics. It's pretty incredible that monarch brains know which way to go. And it goes back to what we talked about with their senses and with these cool antennas. These antennas act as a compass and a clock, telling them which way their animal instincts need them to travel. Now this relay race will continue up to five different generations carrying on the torch, which means the first one will lay their eggs, the second ones will lay their eggs, the third ones will lay their eggs, and so on until we reach five generations of monarchs. Now once they reach their final destination up in Canada, they'll hang out up there for a few months, but then guess what? It's already time to migrate south again. But what I want you to understand is that the monarchs that migrate south are the mightiest monarchs of all. We call them the super generation. 
because they live up to five or six times longer than the ones that moved north, the southbound monarchs make the entire journey on their own. One single butterfly travels the entire distance south compared to all five generations it took to go north. So you might be thinking, that is crazy. Those are almost like superhero monarchs. So you'll see our superhero has a cape and that monarch is flying and flying and flying and it finally reaches Pismo State Beach after about five or six months of just flying in this direction. So now you might be able to imagine how excited these little butterflies are once they see this perfect habitat right next to the beach. The habitat that their grandmas and grandpas and generations long before them had been coming to for hundreds of years. So that is why Pismo State Beach and some of the other overwintering sites along the California coast are such an important part of the story when we learn about the monarch's migration, when we learn about their life cycle, and when we learn about protecting their habitat. Okay, we've done a lot of awesome learning today. The last thing I want us to talk about though, because we've all grown to really love these monarchs. They're so mighty, so incredible, such an important species for our ecosystem here. Monarchs are also pollinators. Does anyone know what a pollinator is? And why is a pollinator important? So we learned about the monarchs sticking out their tongue, out their proboscis to suck up the nectar in the flowers. But did you know when they visit a flower, they're actually covering their bodies in pollen and then they fly off to get a drink at the next flower and they're moving pollen from flower to flower, which is helping our plants grow. So butterflies are a very important part, piece of the puzzle of our bigger environmental issues that are happening on our planet. Some of you may know that the monarchs um, are a species of concern. Scientists are concerned about their populations decreasing, which means the number of monarchs that have been coming to our groves have been getting smaller and smaller each year. Here's a graph that shows the numbers at Pismo State Beach, and you can see that slope. The trend is going down, which means we've had less monarchs. So scientists and park managers and educators like myself, we're very concerned. We are paying close attention to the number of monarchs that are going to come this season. We're going to continue to collect our data to figure out what's happening. But in the meantime, there are a few important things that are contributing that are actually making the monarch population suffer and making their population decline. topic I want you to know about is climate change. So you've probably heard about climate change, maybe you've studied it already in science class, but climate change affects the monarchs because it affects their migration route. And as temperatures change here along California, us humans are noticing it, but so are the animals. And our small insects, like the monarchs, are very sensitive to temperature change. So as temperatures change, we're noting that, but other factors of climate change also include things like wildfires. And this year, in the past couple of years, there have been some pretty large wildfires burning in central and northern California. And where those fires are, are directly en route with where the monarchs migrate. So that is actually having an effect, we think, on where and when they're migrating. Um, it might delay it, they're smart enough, they might know to go around it. Uh, we just don't know at this point, so we're still collecting data. Now besides climate change, another thing that's really affecting the monarchs has to do with milkweed. So we learned that plant is so important for the moms to lay their eggs on. That's the only plant they're going to lay their eggs on. And it's the only plant the caterpillars will eat. So you can imagine we need lots of milkweed for the monarchs to be able to survive. But the problem with milkweed is we are seeing a decline in it. So there's a big effort to plant more milkweed. Um, we're asking people to research their area to learn about what species native to your area grow. And you could plant them in your backyard. If you can't find milkweed, that's okay. You can help butterflies in another way. And it's easy to remember because I love flowers. I love to garden and I love to put flowers in my garden. 
They're fun to look at, they're beautiful, they make me smile, they make me happy, but the flowers are also very important for butterflies and moths and all of our nectaring pollinators. So by creating a butterfly garden with lots of native species that they like to drink and eat, you're also helping the butterflies. Okay, now that we've learned about a few of the different things that are affecting our monarch populations and what we can do to help, I hope you all are inspired to start thinking of ways maybe you can change your school playground, maybe your own backyard, or even ways that you can continue to research about this topic on your own. One other really cool thing that we're asking people to do on their own time is to help us track monarchs. And to do that, you're gonna become a scientist, a community scientist out in your communities. And to do that, it's pretty easy. One way you can do it is to just start observing, start noticing the natural world around you. When you go on your walks, you might wanna bring a little journal with you and you can write down your observations. You can write down what birds you see, what butterflies you see, and the day, maybe the time of year when these animals are in your yard. If you have a computer or a tablet, you can also enter your observations into different databases that help scientists understand where the animals are moving to and from. A really cool one is called iNaturalist. You actually take photos with your phone or with your iPad outside, and then you upload those photos and scientists and park managers can see those photos and understand what's happening around them. So by noticing what's going on and noticing these patterns, you're actually helping scientists get a better understanding for what's happening with our monarchs. So if you're interested in that, I encourage you to start writing down your observations. And another fun way is to just read and research as much as you can about monarchs, about other insects that might be endangered right now too. There's a lot of really cool things to learn about with this topic. So I hope that today you're inspired to keep researching, keep learning on your own, and I hope someday when it's safe to do so, that you and your family might come here on a vacation to Pismo Beach, and you can come visit me here at the Pismo State Beach Monarch Butterfly Grove. So we hope to see you in the park. Thank you so much for joining me and have a great rest of your day. And if you're excited to learn more, be sure to head on over to our Padlet page at the link here and go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel to see more videos about the Western monarch butterfly and check us out on social media. Thanks so much.